Hello there, CBC, and anybody out there tuning in. Welcome to another Revelation Refresh Recap, uh, the second one that uh, we are doing or we've done uh, in our study on Revelation. If you missed last night, uh, this is to help you uh, so that you are uh, geared up and ready to go uh, along with us as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. So I'm just going to go ahead and we're going to shoot from the hip and go for it, starting in verse 12. You may remember last time in our first installment that we ended with John hearing a voice in verse 11, 10 and 11 and saying that voice in verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that is the first and the last, and what you see right in a book and send it to the seven churches that are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to uh, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So we, we ended there. Now John is going to turn around in this time, and he's going to look, and it says in verse 12, when I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and then I turned to see this vo the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. We, we began covering that the first thing seen here by John is, is not Jesus. He sees the lampstands. Now that's significant. Now, this lamp, the lampstands plural, is different from the the lampstands of Exodus uh, back in the day of uh, the Jews, and as they were going and, and and into the 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 tabernacle and then into the temple. When you have the lampstand in the Old Testament, you have a menorah, which is one stand for seven branches. Uh, uh, but this is different. This is seven, you're going to see seven lampstands, all individual, unique. We talked about last time, interestingly enough, why seven and why these churches, we'll discuss more why these churches, but seven, you know, we thought about it, the fact that there's seven continents uh, in the world. Uh, it's interesting. You know, there's seven distinct churches. There's diversity in this. It's interesting that the churches act in unity, though they're very diverse. And uh, churches here in the United States are very different than other cultures and other countries, and there's so there's going to be a diversity. It's kind of explained here. But it's interesting that John sees the lampstands first and doesn't see Jesus. It might, might make us wonder why. Well, right now we know in this time of the church that we see Jesus in the church, the body of Christ. That is what the church is considered, the body of Christ. Uh, you might be the only, you've heard it said, you might be the only Bible that some people read. <laughs> people looking at you and looking at me in the body of Christ. Uh, you and I might be the, the best representation of Jesus that the world sees because he's not here right now. He, he is dwelling in the hearts of men in the church. And so, so when John sees the lamb stands first, I think that's important because I think Jesus is trying to remind him and us, that, that he is living right now, but he's living in through his spirit, through the church. And so, so that's what he sees initially. Now, he's going to see the Son of Man. I don't know. We talked about uh, last night, interestingly. If some of you might have seen the Bethlehem star in, in uh, back in December around Christmas time. It was kind of lackluster, wasn't it? Uh, uh, you know, just to go and get a good view of this was, it wasn't that exciting or interesting. We're going to get a good view of the resurrected Jesus here in these in this this following passage, it's it's amazing, and we'll we'll discuss it here as we continue. So I just want you to see he sees the lampstands. That's that's first what he sees. That's significant. That's interesting, and Jesus should be seen in the church. Should be seen in us, right? Amen. All right. Well, it continues, and it says here, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Now, we're going to get in this verse 13 and following, we're going to see the countenance of Jesus, the, the presence of Jesus, which was seen in Matthew 17, uh, verse, uh, verse 2. Um, there are some things that are indicative of him here in verse 13. I want to cover that's in your notes. It says he has a garment down to the feet and girded about, he's girded about with the chest with a golden band. Um, this is indicating the royal priesthood that Jesus is in charge of. We talked about it in our Hebrew study. Uh, this is dynamic. It's the, the long robes show royalty. The, the band across his waist is very similar to that of the priestly garments in Exodus 29 and 39. And so we see here the royal priesthood. This is Jesus, and, uh, and that is, is, is how he's, he's garbed. That's how he's robed. 
uh, here, and that's significant because you and I are part of that royal priesthood. A, 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 in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of the Levitical system, in the order of Melchizedek. And uh, so Jesus, he, he, he's got that garment on, the, the garment down to his feet and the chest um, band that he has that's golden. Uh, his head and hair were like wool. Now, now we're starting to get the 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 dynamics of his body features uh, in this. Now, it's gonna we're gonna talk about his countenance shining like the sun. Now, I've got in your notes that there are how many elements of Christ's countenance here? I count seven. Uh, now, we had some debate last night at uh, at our study, but I think we see here seven new elements, and I can count them out for you that are revealed to John that he did not see in Matthew 17, verse 2, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Amazing passage, Matthew 17, verse 2. We talk about him shining like the sun. Remember, in chapter 16, there were no chapter divisions in the gospel account. They were added later. And in chapter 16, Jesus promises to his disciples that some of them would see the coming kingdom in its glory before they died. And not all of them got to see this, but some did, and some saw Jesus in that glorified state there. Uh, uh, Peter, James, and John on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, you right remember there, starting in chapter 17, verse 2. Some people try to use chapter 16 saying Jesus didn't. Jesus said that they would see his kingdom, but it never came, and so Jesus is a liar. That's not true. They, they, they fail to continue reading into chapter 17. And we see the manifestation of the kingdom. We see Jesus glorified. His presence, his countenance shone like the sun. That was revealed to John at that time. Amazing stuff. But here we get more of that revelation. And there's seven components to Jesus that let's talk about. It says here, his head and hair were like wool. First, his head and hair were like wool. That, that ascribes to him that he's the ancient of days. Uh, they're white and they're pure, it says. Uh, white as snow. That that that's it's wonderful to see that there's purity, but then there's there's uh, this this white like wool. The idea is is that he's uh, somebody had mentioned. I think it was uh, uh, Jeff Pritchett mentioned that it makes him sound like the lamb, and that's interesting because of the wool. It, it reminds us of images of the lamb, Jesus being the lamb, and I think that's significant too. But the wool, that, that hair like wool, reminds us of age. He is the Ancient of Days. Isaiah talks about that. Daniel 7, uh, 9 reminds us about him being the Ancient of Days. Uh, that is Jesus. He is, uh, he, he's pure, um, and he's, but he's wise. And that's what we see, especially when we uh, notice that about the hair. Uh, mine's getting there, so it feels like it. At least in that sheen, I can see in the light here, it's getting white. Anyway, no, no, no. Anyway, we continue on. And eyes were like flames of fire, a flame of fire. His eye, now we're, his eyes were like flames of fire. Y you got to understand, we're saying like, so these are similes. That doesn't mean that his eyes were burning bright like fire, like some strange thing. Uh, no, no, this means that I saw his eyes and it just, it was like fire. It was like fire, determination, piercing. Now, we know that our God is a consuming fire, as it says in Hebrews 12, 29. I like that because you might remember in the Exodus, uh, the Lord was a consuming fire in a bush, but it didn't consume. Uh, he consumed the bush. It, it was enveloped in flames, but it, it didn't take over. So, so fire can be a blessing. It can be purifying. It can be awe-inspiring, like you know who thinks that, because I'm the pyro. Um, but anyway, understand this, though. Fire, eyes like fire, for some, it can be devastating. Fire can be obviously terrifying, but it can also be purifying, encouraging, awe-inspiring. Our God is a consuming fire. We see that uh, fire is going to uh, melt the earth someday. It's going to burn with fervent heat. In Second Peter chapter three, and so fire is gonna 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 do away with the old and bring on the new. Now some are not gonna be able to to uh, uh, resist that fire. Some are gonna be thrown into the lake of fire. Those things are negative and bad. But you and I will be able to stand as those did uh, in Daniel in the midst of the fire with Jesus. It won't be burned and it'll be all made new. That's pretty amazing. So so Jesus has this this fiery component. And, uh, and it's amazing. His eyes are like fire. He sees all. And what he sees, he purifies. And uh, what his eyes are on, they can, they can warm and heat. 
and they can make well or make right um, or they can terrify. Uh, so yeah, we're dealing with Jesus here and he means business. So his eyes are like fire. His feet are like fine brass. His feet are like fine brass. That, that In Old Testament thought that that should bring about many uh, illusions. In fact, a Jew would probably think of this as in what we call an idiom, something that you say uh, something's like brass is it, just a common uh, thought uh, of some things in the Old Testament like judgment. Uh, um, things that make you think immediately of what what uh, is being understood. You might remember in Exodus 27 that the ex Exodus 27, uh, Moses lifted up a a brass serpent up on a stick, in so that as Israel as they were getting eaten by fiery serpents on, on the earth and being judged, as they looked up on the brazen serpent, that brass serpent, they would be healed. And in fact, Jesus gives understanding in John 3:14 through 7 that just as even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And all who look upon him, that is the idea, would be saved. As Jesus was lifted up on the cross, as we look to him, we find salvation. We look to him, we find healing. We look to him. So we we, we, we have Jesus taking our judgment. Taking That's the idea of brass is, is judgment. Uh, and, and his feet, his feet are judgment. And we talked about some of the images that we see. You know, Jesus is going to crush Satan under his feet. And that, that judgment is going to come in these feet of brass. That's interesting. But Jesus has taken that on for you and for me. Um, his feet were held to the fire, literally, for you and for me uh, because of the sin that we have. But we were healed by what Jesus, Jesus did. Uh, th this speaks of his 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 firmness in the work that he accomplished on the cross. Some some we were talking even a little bit about last night. You see some people, well, especially like Nancy Pelosi right now, which is just silly. Um, but uh, medical institutions, things like that, wearing a caduceus. It's a brass serpent on a pole. Interesting, because you can see the Israelites back in the Old Testament started worshiping that brass serpent on a pole rather than the whole reason. This is looking to Jesus, looking to salvation in faith in God and what he says and what he asks us to do. And so that brass serpent had to be done away with uh, in the Old Testament. Now people are still worshiping these things, the makings of man. And it shouldn't be so. We should keep our eyes firmly on Jesus. Jesus is the one that heals. He's the one that saves. He's the one that has taken, uh, been through the fire for you and for me uh, because of our sin. But he uh, did it, and he's firm in what he did. His feet are like brass. I, the voice, his voice, were the sound of many waters. Had the sound of many waters. Uh, uh, scriptures like Psalm ninety-three four uh, relays that God's voice is mightier than the waters. Uh, Jesus' voice stilled the seas in Matthew eight. You might remember in that instance where he calmed the seas with his voice. His voice is like many waters. So we see that it's not that it is water when he speaks, but but it's powerful. Uh, Chuck Missler, I think, has said it best. You don't argue with waves. Um, and that's the idea here is that God speaks. And when he speaks, we ought to be listening because when he speaks, it's authoritative. It's loud. It means business. And so whenever we open up God's word, we should be attentive. Whenever we're praying to the Lord and he speaks to us and to our hearts, we ought to be listening. It's like many waters. It rolls. It rolls and it's constant. It continues. Uh, but we should be listening. We should be listening. So, so interesting voice like many waters. It's authoritative. It speaks. His hand now, his hand, it says, held the stars here. Uh, it continues, and it says his voice was like many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, we'll talk about those stars. Those stars are considered the angels or the messengers, and we'll talk at the end of this about what that is. But the idea here is that they, he is, his, his, his hand is holding not necessarily the stars in the sky. We're talking about angels, messengers. The mystery will be revealed at the end of this chapter. But he's holding angelic beings or he's holding the messengers of the gospel. We'll see in, that there could be either of those that we're talking about here. But he's got that in his hand. He's significant. His hand is holding things together. Um, and uh, his hand is holding the message. His hand is holding you and me. Is holding the church. And, and so we see a strong hand. And we're going to see his hand pop up here in a little bit and do a great work again. 
Uh, so, so his hand is holding the stars, and it says out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. A sharp two-edged sword. Uh, think about it. Uh, not a sword coming out of his mouth, and he's some weird, you know, guy that walked out of the, you know, tattoo parlor or something that freak you out. No, the idea is is that that, that the word, the word of God, is powerful, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Hebrews four twelve reminds us. The word, it was the word of God that spoke everything into existence. And by his word, it will be redone, remade in the new heaven and new earth. It's by the word. The word is powerful. When Jesus comes back, by the word of his mouth, he'll put down the nations, it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. By his word. By his word. I'm, I'm confident in the Lord. I'm, I'm encouraged that, that whatever I'm facing today, whatever you're facing today, whatever is going on, even geopolitically in this country, could be put down simply by the word of God. Just simply by the word of God. Um, amazing. The Lord is so, Jesus is so powerful. His word, his word, his word is so powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. And in Hebrews four twelve, that that time that it's used as a sword, it, that's a that's a small sword. It's it's a it's a smaller sword used that you could be like a fillet sword. You know, it, it cuts joint and marrow, soul and spirit. As it says, it, it can discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what Hebrews is talking about. It's it's a small sword. It's a tactical sword. Now in Ephesians, we we talk about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's a that's actually mentioning in the Greek a large sword. And it's able to cut down and it's able to defend and it's able to, you know, own. Right. So the word has many, many ways in which it works, but it's powerful nonetheless. It does a work that only it can do, uh, not, not man. And so the word, it's powerful. The word that came out of his mouth was powerful. And that's what that's what. Uh, John is wanting us to know it, it's a powerful, mighty powerful. I think it was Beth that mentioned last night, wasn't it? Jesus's word when he spoke that he was the one that the, the 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 soldiers and Judas were seeking. When he said, "I am He" to them, when they were looking for uh, the Jesus Christ, uh, when he said, "I am He," remember they fell back in, in a very strange way, scared, stiff. Uh, power knocked him to the ground. Amazing. And uh, this is our God. This is Jesus. He, he's not the he's not the, the 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 little the little lamb in the corner, uh, the lovey dovey kind of person that sometimes we make. And we're getting the revelation of Jesus and he means business. And it continues. And it says that his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And that's his presence, his presence, similar to mentioned in Matthew 17 two, But we had these the head, the hair, the eyes, the feet. The voice, the hand, the mouth, you got all of these, these new understandings of who Jesus is uh, in this revelation. Amazing stuff. Uh, now, look at this. He, he got this vision, Jesus, or John did of Jesus. And look what happens. It says in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I mean, I think when you and I see Jesus, we'll be in awe, but then I think we'll be on the ground. I think I think it's just going to be, oh, my goodness, that is him. Um, it, it, it's, it's fearful. It's dreadful. It's amazing. But in that fear and dread and all, look what happens. And he laid, but he rather laid his right hand, his right hand. On me. That's the strong hand. That's the idea. He laid his strong hand upon me. He's going to strengthen John here. And saying to me, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now listen to this. Interesting. Do not be afraid. John is as though dead on the ground. Jesus is going to deal with seven. Another seven. See, we talk about tons of seven. Seven's all over in this book. Amazing. It's just how it's called structural integrity to the word. Structural integrity, meaning that no man could have written this and intended to do all of these things. It's written by the Holy Spirit in its amazing way. Uh, uh, amazing stuff. Another seven things. Look what Jesus says here. Do not be afraid. He deals with seven of the major fears. And that's what I have in our notes. He deals with seven major fears of man is dealt with here. Look at this. I am. Listen. I am. That's Jesus declaring himself to be God. I am. And that's italicized in your, your Bibles and in mine, because that's, he, that's a statement of who he is. I am he who lives, number one. Or sorry, sorry, sorry. Do not be, oh, oh, oh I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Sorry, I'm getting into myself. Don't be afraid. First, he says, I am the first. I'm the first. And that, that deals with creation. 
uh, that deals with creation. Now, there's a whole debate out all over the world, uh, whether it's evolution or creation. Did we just become from slime or did we did we really were we really intelligently designed? And, and that's a fear. Uh, it should be a fear among people. If we're just survival of the fittest and evolutionary processes, and then, then there's no point. There's no intelligence. There's there's no hope. There's no hope. Some of those who believe in evolution are the most hopeless people because there's no design, there's no, there's no plan. And, and, and that should cause fear. That's why there's fear all over the place. If people die of COVID and all these other things, listen, Jesus is the first. That is, he is there. He was there at the beginning of creation. He's the first. He's the, the beginning and the end. Jesus is there. He is the creator, in fact, we see in the epistles. He's the creator. He's there. That, he, that should deal with one of the major fears uh, of pre, pre-existence, all that stuff. It's Jesus. Jesus, he was there in creation. I'm the first and the last. He's dealing with eternity. And another thing that makes people afraid, and not knowing the future, not knowing what's ahead, not knowing what is going to go on out there into eternity. Jesus said, I am first, I am last. You could trust me for both. So that's those two. Now, Continues, and behold, I'm alive, for, or sorry, uh, uh, first and the last, I'm getting ahead of myself, again, 18, I am he who lives, I am he who lives. This is a, a statement of the incarnation. This is God came in the flesh and lives uh, against all of the other heretical religions that are out there. Not heretical, they're just false religions, total false religions. They give no hope that God cares so much that he would send his son in the flesh to, to dwell on this earth in the flesh like you and like me, to identify with you and with me. Uh, the fear there that God is other, he's so transcendent, he doesn't care about me. That, that fear is dealt with here. Uh, the Lord came in the incarnation, and he lives. That's the idea. He lives. He lives. He came, and, and we're going to see how it's written here, though, that he's going to resurrect. So that's another category. But this is proven in his life that he cares for me and for you. So it continues on, and he says, I am, I am he who uh, lives, was dead, was dead. And, and when I, that's a statement dealing with sin. I believe, dealing with our sin, dealing with the punishment of sin, which is death. Uh, Jesus dealt with that. He, he promised, I am the resurrection and the life, right? Jesus promised that whoever, though he dies, yet he'll live forevermore if you believe that is in him. Uh, uh, but understand this, that, that I, I'm, I'm alive, so I came and I incarnated. I, I, was, I was dead. I, I dealt with sin. Sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And now I'm alive forevermore. That's the resurrection. And Jesus promised resurrection life to those who are in him. Uh, We're all going to be resurrected someday. Some that don't put their trust in him into the resurrection, which is a not good resurrection, into the lake of fire. Uh, But those in Christ will be resurrected uh, uh, in glory, and to him, and to his plan that we'll talk about throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, so that deals with the resurrection. What happens when we die? People are afraid of death, and yet Jesus promises that he is alive forevermore. He is the way, the way to eternal life. Nothing to be afraid of. So don't be afraid. And he continues, and he says uh, that um I am, it says, amen, amen. Uh, I am the, the, he's saying amen because that's the gospel in a nutshell. He, he was, he, he lived, he died, and now he's alive. Amen, amen. And I hold the keys of two things, Hades and death. Now he holds the keys of Hades. That is to say that he is in control of the unseen realm. And I know so many are scared and afraid of the unseen realm, the demonic, all those things. Listen, Jesus holds the keys to that. Remember, it says in the New Testament that that on the cross, what he did, he disarmed the powers of darkness and made a public display of them, a public shame of them. Uh, he now holds the key. And uh, Sam, some of evil's everywhere. Don't you see it nowadays, Jim? Evil is going crazy. Listen, it may be for sure, and lawlessness is abounding. We understand that. But listen, the Lord is in control of it all to bring it to its end, to let it fall in on itself and do a great work in that, to undo evil in a very glorious way. 
And so trust the Lord. He's in control. He's in control of the unseen realm. He's in control of those things, Hades. That, that, that's the idea of, uh, of the unseen uh, darkness, uh, Hades, uh, and death. Now, now death, here, he, Jesus defeated death once and for all uh, in what he did. And uh, he is in control of that. He's in control of the unseen realm, the darkness. He's in control of death. And we're going to see that later on, it's important that he's in control of hell. Uh, He is making sure that hell doesn't get out (laughs) in eternity. He's in control of the realm of the dead. He's in control of the dark demonic. He's in control of all of that. And so we can trust him. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of anything because in Christ, we don't have anything to fear. And that Jesus, with his right hand, upholds John and says, hey, don't be afraid. This powerful guy is on your side. I I love it. Just such good vision, understanding of who Jesus is presently, now, even in heaven. Um, Now he continues. And and this is the next section that we need to see that helps guide us through chapters two. Well, actually guides through the rest of the book. The Lord gives us, Jesus gives us a wonderful, easy outline and a guide to not only the next couple of chapters, but the rest of the book. He gives an easy outline. And look what he says here. He says, write the things that you have seen. First, number one, the things you've seen. That's chapter one. Uh, that's the things you've seen. That's Christ's revelation. He, well, all these things that, that he just saw, uh, Jesus said, write this stuff down. And so write the things which you've seen. The next thing it says, write the things which are. That is presently. What's going on during John's present time? Uh, That's the time of the church, the advancement of the gospel, the the things that are taking place and taking shape as the church expands across the globe at this time in Revelation, even under a great oppression of the Roman Empire. Uh, So we're going to see in chapters 2 and 3, which is that next section, the things that are, uh, how Jesus addresses the churches, what his thoughts are about the churches, how the church age is going to look. And what he expects of the church, and we'll see even how it comes to an end um, in one of the churches specifically. So write the things which are, that is two and three, that is the church age you could put in your outline. And then it says here, write the things that are after this. And and the word in the Greek here is metatauta. And and interestingly enough, from chapter 4, verse 1, where it begins saying, after this, metatauta, and on that that phrase is used metatauta after this and after this and after this so from chapter 4 verse 1 all the way to the end of the book that is the last section the things that are after this and what does that describe that describes the tribulation final 7 years of tribulation on earth that describes the kingdom that is the kingdom of Christ coming down on earth, the new heaven and new earth, all that. From chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book, that's the final section. And those divisions will help us, I believe, understand the book of Revelation very simply and very helpfully. It'll work. It makes sense. And it gets our timeline, I believe, in order. Jesus wanted that distinction made the first chapter one, Christ's revelation, chapters two and three, the church age, chapter uh, four, all the way through the end of the book and chapters 22, that is the tribulation, the time of the kingdom. We'll see some of the dynamics in four and five of you and I being in heaven during the time of a lot of those things taking place on earth. Amazing stuff. Now, that's the, that's the outline. He gives a little bit of understanding here that we need. Verse 20, it says the mystery We talked about mysteries on Sunday at church in Ephesians. The book of Ephesians talks about mysteries given to the church specifically, not to the Jews, not to those Old Testament saints, those Old Testament prophets that were looking for these things. Couldn't make sense of a lot of the ways in which God has organized things, but in the church has fulfilled many things. Amazing. Not all, but many. Brought about many mysteries. We talked about the mystery of the kingdom of heaven when the Jews were looking for this earthly kingdom there's this mysterious heavenly kingdom uh, that that's kind of a parenthetical ex, uh, expression of god's grace that's going to happen before an earthly kingdom it's you and i in the church it's a promised mystery for the church so here's some mysteries as it relates to the church as we continue this is the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand verse 20 and the seven golden lampstands very clearly the seven stars are angels of the seven churches now, angels, it says angels here, stars, 
angels. Angels here, the word used is angelos. Uh, that is translated messengers. Now, in the New Testament, it's used specifically for angels, and it's used also for messengers, just a typical messenger. Like, I'm a messenger to you today, bringing this information to you. And so is it stars like angels? Or are the stars angels? Or are the stars pastors? Some Bible commentators believe they're pastors. Some Bible commentators believe they're literal angels. I say, why can't it be both? I really believe that Jesus uses angels to protect part of his plan. Uh, Hebrews 1, 14. Are they not? That is the angels. Uh, ministering spirits for those who inherit uh, salvation. Uh, chapter 13, verse 2 of Hebrews. You might remember uh, some of us, many of us, those in the church, entertain angels unaware. Not even knowing you've entertained an angel, maybe. Believe it or not. Hard to believe, almost. But but interestingly enough, uh, Paul saw it that way. If Paul wrote Hebrews, saw it that way. So are there angels protecting and guarding the churches? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think Calvary Bible Church is like, you know, the the a, a, a different version of Caleb out there. For those of you who know Caleb, tall Caleb. And, and then Caleb, not only Caleb, but Caleb with his armor on. And, you know, he's got his his, his knightly armor and, you know, his, his, uh, his, his big axe, battle axe. And, you know, I don't know, whatever. But 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 I, I hope to think that there maybe is an angel that's watching over our church. But then could it be that the, the messengers of the church are held in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ? I sure hope so. Man, I, I trust and believe and hope that the Lord is holding up and holding me up and holding pastors all over the church up and that that's the case. And, and if that's the case, then then the Lord is in control and in, in, in helping the message along, the message along. So I, I think this is just showing that the Lord is in control. He's in control of his church. And we're going to talk about that as it looks to, we look to chapter two and talking about Ephesus next week. But the lampstands, the lampstands as well are mentioned here. And the lampstands are clearly the churches. It's pretty simple and pretty plain that way. But I want you to know, we talked about this last night. The church is a lampstand. The church is not the light. The church is the lampstand. It holds the light. In fact, Jesus said uh, in the gospels, you remember Jesus told us that we should not be uh, those kind of stands or those that would, uh, take the light and hide it under a bushel or, or, or take it, take the light and try to put it on a stand and try to keep it down or keep it away from people having to be, you know, see it. Uh, no, no, you, 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 you set the light up on a stand and you let it shine for all to see. Now, now it's important that you and I are effective lampstands that we're, we're showing Christ in what we do. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, as we began, uh, that's what this book is about, that people would see Jesus, and may they see Jesus in us. Now, we're not Jesus. We're just the stand. We're not the light. The Spirit of God working in you and in me is the light. The, the Word of God, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of this book is the light. Uh, we're in the flesh. We're going to make mistakes. Let people know that. Uh, tell people to trust in the word, to trust in the light, to trust in Jesus Christ, not in in me, in the stand. But don't do everything you can in your life to to let the light shine. Don't don't hide it, but let it out. That that's the idea. You and I are lampstands for a purpose, so that others can see the light of Christ in you and in me. That's why we are the lampstands. That's why the lampstands were seen first here at the beginning of this vision so that Jesus could be seen. He needs to be seen in us. He needs to be seen in this church in this dark day. I would hope that the world's not seen my political opinions or my thoughts or my things on Facebook. And I'm guilty. I'm, I'm human. But may he be seen in me. May Jesus be seen in my Facebook post. May Jesus be seen in this video. May Jesus be seen in the workplace, wherever we go. May we be in about Jesus being seen in us, in us, because that is who Jesus has decided at this time to use, is you and me, to be the carriers of his light. And, and I pray that you aren't discouraged, but you'd see that you're a vessel for the Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, that's it for this chapter, this installment. Thank you for hanging in with us. I'm going to pray for you as we close and uh, just once again, thank you for recapping with us. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your word. I pray that uh, it sets into fertile ground, Lord, in our lives, that we wouldn't take these visions of Jesus, um, Lord, uh, just as another information bit, but that we would hold dear to them. 
Lord, that Jesus, we see you dealing with every fear, able to handle every situation, uh, more than capable, Lord, of dealing with the things that concern us today. Uh, Lord, forgive us for the times that we have tried to uh, lessen, dim the glory of who you desire to be in us. Help us to be effective lampstands. And as we study the churches in the weeks to come, would you help us, Lord, help us to be the church and be the people in the church that you would desire for us to be at this time. Uh, Lord, we ask for more of your spirit and less of our flesh. Help us, Lord, to live out these truths to your honor and glory. And I thank you, Lord. I pray your blessing on these that have tuned in, listening to this. And I pray that you continue to encourage them in this wonderful book of Revelation. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been great to hang out with you. Hope this has been encouragement to you. Stay tuned next week, next Wednesday. We'll talk about a recap in Revelation then. We'll see you.